in your product development, you want to do research on what sells because what sells the industry will change. Um, what sells, there are some things that are always going to be timeless and very classic. In your product development, um, I will say this, there are a few things that I just rarely to, to never do, especially if I'm selling on Etsy. I don't do um, hardly ever beds. I did one time, I did a bed one time because it came, it was beautiful. It was French, super ornate, came with the whole set. I did it. And the reason I don't do beds is like big beds, like king beds, queen beds. A lot of shippers don't like to ship beds because even just like a king headboard is super hard to move around the trailer because they're usually longer than what the trailer is wide. Um, so now I kind of leave that unless I just get a very stunning set, which once in a blue moon happens, I kind of leave that to be a custom order. And then I don't do dining sets because the cost to ship all the different chairs, it, it's just too much. So, and I don't find that for me, when I have put dining sets on Etsy, they haven't sold well. So I stay away most of the time. There are a few exceptions, but most of the time I stay away from beds and I stay away from dining sets. So that's one thing in your product development. You want to look at what is really selling well, the shops that are selling a lot of furniture. What types of pieces are they selling? Not just the styles, but what types are selling. That'll really give you an idea for product development and what the market is buying right now. For your market research, your market is always going to be changing. Your industry is going to be changing as your design trends change. There's a, is farmhouse still in style? I mean, I think so. There's some, I know there's people that disagree with me, but I, I still see it sell. The plain black furniture painted at like a farmhouse black with some appropriate mild distressing, not distressed all over in weird places. And like your French country, white, very neutral pieces, which is also could translate to farmhouse pieces. They, I'm still seeing those sell really well. I will say on those types of pieces, you have more of a, a market competition. The market's a little more saturated. And also brand new items are sold in those colors. So as you veer off into blues and greens and different pastels and different colors that are harder grays and harder for people to find, um, then you're going to have a better chance of selling. I have created some very niche type pieces. I just, because I wanted to experiment with like some designs. I painted an armor, had a jungle theme all over. It was beautiful. I thought it was beautiful to me. Um, I thought it was my most eclectic, one of my most stunning pieces. And I had it for a year and a half. It sat on Etsy for a year and a half before it sold. It finally sold for like $3,500. And it was shipped, it went to Las Vegas, which did not surprise me. I was very in line with the kind of Vegas style. So if you create some super eclectic, moody maximalism, that type of pieces, your buying um, audience is a lot smaller. So that's something to think about. I mean, there is a, a market for that, but it's going to grow smaller. And so like the more acceptable your colors are and your style are to the mainstream audience, the more sales you're going to have. And if you just want to be like, nope, this is my artistic style. It's all I'm going to do. That's great. More power to you. You just might not have as steady as a sales cycle as you would hope to see. That's my only thought on that, I want to say. Um, that's been my experience. I have created a beautiful purple piece on the nightstand, and it sold really well. I, I felt like I was kind of taking a risk with it, but it sold really well, I think, in like two weeks on Etsy for a good price. So you'll kind of learn the market, but the best way to do it is to always be learning, always stay on top of the trends. Look at what's selling the shops that you may follow on the Etsy 
you can click on like there's a on the top left the shop name and it says how many sales if you click the sales how it will actually show you what has been sold and so and then also when you read the reviews you can click the little image and see what it was sold for and you know what was sold and what people are saying about it so again i know i've said it before but a wealth of information that is free i'm just like a ever since i started for a few years ago almost almost on a daily basis i am checking the market and looking at what is selling i don't spend all day on it i don't even spend an hour on it like 15 20 minutes a day i'll be looking through seeing what's selling if i want to go price a unique armor or a big hutch or something i'll see what's out there like it and i'll kind of use that i don't find anything like it i'm usually going to raise my price a little higher than what is out there because that tells me i have a really unique piece i am excited to share this part with you this is for the beginner and this is also for the person that has been painting furniture for a while, but they're really just kind of beginning to launch their business or they're resetting, restarting their business. Here's what I want to share with you. You will never be happier than you are in your first year of entrepreneurship. Embrace it. In your first year, you have so much freedom. You're charting your course. You're developing your style. You find out what you want to sell. You're picking up pieces. It's just there's not a lot of overhead. There's not a lot. Like I think about shop rent every, every month. I just like all these things. And so there's a lot more logistics. There's more website development. There's more marketing. There's more paperwork. There's more everything as your business grow, grows. Do not despise humble beginnings. Embrace it. Enjoy it. And I, it's just a mindset of like attitude it is in personality like do you want to be a grumbler and complainer or do you just want to embrace it how you start out if you're starting out slow and at the bare minimum that's how i started out how you start out is not how you're going to end if you follow these steps how you start out is not where you're going to be in a year in six months it's just not where you're going to be if you do these things and these are all of these steps are very actionable tasks that you can do. They truly are to the extent that you want to do them. People watching this, like for everybody's going to be on a different path. There's one lady in a recent Zoom class when we went around and we and we had everybody say, how much do you want to make next year? One person said they want to make 150000 One person said 60000 One person, another person said like, 50,000. Another person said she want to make thousand dollars a month. That was great for her. That's what was her goal because she's doing other things. This wasn't a full time, full blown business. She wanted to make a thousand dollars a month because that was going to contribute extra spending money and give her some financial freedom, do some things she wanted, having an extra thousand dollars a month. For some people, a thousand dollars a month is going to pay their car note plus you know some of their utilities and if that's what you want to contribute to your household that is great so don't despise like these small beginnings and just begin like thinking about what you want your business to look like what you want to make and, and it's exciting time don't do it isolated don't do it alone begin networking begin having community begin reaching out to other people and so the embrace your first year of entrepreneurship because as your business grows the responsibilities grow with it and that first year is a great time to really hone in your schedule hone in your business plan your structure and your business plan like i'm gonna you know sell x amount of pieces if you want to make fifty thousand or 60 or 80 or whatever I'm going to sell X amount of pieces a month at this price and they're generally going to be finished in this style. This is where I'm going to sell them. And so you want to have these things in mind. I'm going to use these three methods to market. And I want to say this, 
Oh, if I could go back and tell you, like, you know, if I could go back and change some of the things I've done in the past, a big thing that I would change is I would be filming everything that I did from the start. It doesn't mean that I would keep hundreds of hours of videos, but if I'm painting a dresser, I would film five, six minutes of it painting, being painted, or I would do a time lapse. If I'm mixing paint, pouring it over, you know, pouring it into a canister or whatever, I would film that for a minute. That is going to be social media and video is going to be a huge part of your marketing, huge part of growing your following, of connecting with an audience. And even if you're connecting with other furniture painters and crafters and artists, you, social media, as you produce content that is relative to people more in video, when you have substance in video, social media will begin producing that, showing those videos to more people, your content to more people, and it grows your audience. And again, like showing how you refinish what you do, it alleviates anxiety and customers as well. So I would, I would go back and if it were, if I would redo something differently, I would begin filming most of the things I did a lot earlier because video is huge. And you may think, I don't want to get on video. I don't want to do that. Listen, me neither. <laughs> I'm serious, me neither. But there's some things we just have to do. I don't like putting on top coats, but I have to do it. It's part of my furniture. You know, part of like the furniture being a good product. And so we're going to go into one of our last couple of things. And that is, um, there is a saying, which, which is true, is that struggling business people will spend, uh, they will spend time to save money. But rich business people who've got it figured out will spend money to save time. Money can be replaced. Time cannot be replaced. I have somebody that comes in a few hours a week and works at my shop. Brenda, she's wonderful. She'll come in. She'll prime pieces. She'll put on some top coats. She'll prep them. She'll scuff sand clean and scuff sand them. And I go in and paint. It's not... I didn't start out doing that. I didn't do that till about year two or three, but in hindsight, I would have done that earlier. Even if you pay somebody, a high school person or a retired person, Brenda is a retired person. Uh, I, she didn't know anything about refinishing furniture. I taught her hands on, she learned, and for two years, she's just been going like crazy. I can trust her with anything. And so, like, if you can sell a piece of painted furniture for $2,200, $2,500, and you can, then if you can have somebody come in and prime and paint, or not prime, but come in and um, not paint, but prime, you know, clean them up for you and prime them or put on the liquid sander or sand them for you, and you come in and do the artistic paint finish that for the style you've developed, and I mean, that's going to greatly um, expand your ability to, like, produce more product and you want to produce more product to produce more income. So I might pay Brenda $150 a week for working, you know, eight hours or so. But then also from those eight hours, like I am saving a lot of my time where I get to pay more furniture and send more pieces out the door and now and also invest into other streams of revenue. So that's something to think about.